What's going on, guys? Welcome back to WWE Network and Chill, where I, Graham Jason Matthews, break down all the original content I watch on the WWE Network. Today, we're talking the latest special to hit the network this morning, entitled The Future WWE, The Story of FCW. Uh, when I first heard about this a few weeks ago, I was very excited just because it was always weird to me that we hear so much about NXT and the glamour and glitz that it has today and the brand that it's become, and, and rightfully so, I love NXT. I have all the NXT DVDs. I've seen them all a million times over. NXT's rise is very well documented, as well as OVW as well. I, I feel like through the Ruthless Aggression show and all the major superstars that came from there, but not so much FCW. You never really hear much about FCW ever, um, just because, I don't want to say it was short-lived, but OVW was like their go-to developmental territory for many, many years, from like the late 90s to the early 2000s through like the mid-2000s. Deep South is also kind of talked about in that same vein from the mid-2000s as a stepping stone of the WWE main roster. But what I never actually knew was that WWE didn't own Deep South. They didn't own OVW, which, I mean, I kind of figured, I mean, I, I didn't know that for a fact, um, but I mean, obviously OVW I think is still around today. So I guess, obviously, they may not have owned it outright. But um, anyway, we hear a lot about Deep South and OVW and the stars that those territories created. But never really FCW. So FCW, as I'll get to into in a second, kind of came to be around 2006, 2007, up until it closed in 2012. So it was only really around for 12, or up until 2012, it was only really around for about five years there. It was kind of the bridge from what OVW and, and Deep South were um, for WWE at that point. I think OVW was also kind of a developmental territory for Impact at one point after WWE severed ties with them uh, several years ago. Um, but FCW was kind of what we had in between OVW and then later NXT. But the amount of superstars that came out of FCW is unbelievable. Like... You can always make the argument, and I absolutely still say this to this day, that WWE lacks stars, but not to the fault of FCW. So it's not like, oh, OVW had all these stars and FCW didn't. FCW had so much star power come from there, um, and it's more a matter of how WWE treats these stars. That's a whole other argument. But in terms of the sheer talent that came out of Florida between, I mean, there's, an, there, there's so many more people that didn't even cover here. Seth Rollins was a big prospect from FCW, a big project down there, one of their top champions. Uh, Damian Sandow, they didn't cover. Cesaro was there for a cup of coffee. Cassius Ono, Kofi Kingston was there for a while before he debuted. For Maybe not too, too long, but before he went to um, ECW, he was down in FCW. Drew McIntyre came out of there. Sheamus. Wade Barrett was a big star down in FCW. Heath Slater, Bo Dallas, Bray Wyatt. God, the list goes on and on and on. Charlotte, Sasha Banks, before NXT, were down in FCW. Bailey was another one. So many people. Serena D, before she went up to the main roster as part of the Straight Edge Society. Um, I could go on and on and on. There are so many stars that came out of FCW that always confused me and bothered me that it was never really given the recognition it deserved until now. So I was very happy about that. You'll, you'll see some FCW shows, like some moments and matches here and there on the network, um, specifically when we had that, um, what was it called, the Hidden Gems section on the network, which they don't really do sections and collections anymore, but they had that section of the network about a year or two ago where they would upload old matches, and largely it was older stuff from the 70s and 80s and 90s and even early 2000s with dark matches and stuff, but they included a lot of FCW stuff too. I remember watching like a Rollins versus Ambrose match, um, like a 15-minute FCW, whatever their like Iron Man championship was at that point. I watched that about a year ago, and it was quite good. Um, I think they had like a shield triple threat down there. Roman Reigns came down from FCW. So many other people, it's ridiculous. And that was largely because of Steve Kern. So to give a background on Steve Kern, I was very happy to kind of shine light on him as well because um, he's a very underrated aspect of the WWE developmental system from that point. And, you know, Dusty Rhodes gets a lot of credit for NXT as he should, as he does with FCW in this documentary. But Steve, Steve Kern was the head man in charge of FCW for as long as it was around for. So uh, to kick off this thing, we hear from a lot of different superstars. Kurt Hawkins being another one. Another guy that was like fledgling 
that was floundering in WWE for quite a while there after him and Ryder broke up. He went down to FCW to restart his career, and he took off. Tyson Kidd was another guy that got his start in FCW. The Bella Twins, Natalia, Byron Saxton, another guy. I, I could just go on and on and on. But anyway, so after hearing from several superstars and trainers and you know whoever else about what FCW meant to them, uh, we hear from Steve Kern himself, who talks about the wrestling history, the rich wrestling history that that we've had in Florida over the many, you know, several decades. Um, at, you know, growing up, he used to pick up wrestlers from the airport when he was young, before going to college. Uh, while he was in college, he was told by someone, I forgot who, that he would make a great wrestler. And he figured, hey, why not try this out? College ain't working out anyway. Why not try the wrestling thing? So he started back in, I think, 1972. Soon after, formed a tag team called the Fabulous Ones with Stan Lane. And then many years later in the early 1990s, became Skinner in WWE. Kind of a dumb gimmick, didn't really go anywhere, wasn't all too successful, but a memorable character nonetheless. And he was like a real-life alligator hunter for, for hobby. So that's kind of where the gimmick came from. It wasn't one of those dumb... Th- I mean, maybe Duke the Dumpster Rose, he was a trash man, was a garbage collector in his free time. I don't know. But at least with um, Steve Kern, he was uh, an alligator... Um, an alligator hunter in, in his free time. So that's kind of where the gimmick came from, I believe. He also portrayed Doink the Clown for a very brief period, which I did not know. I know, obviously, Matt Bourne did it um, many, many years. He was obviously the original Doink. And then the Brooklyn Brawler had done it for a while, I think maybe in recent years, whenever they brought back the Doink character. Not Matt Bourne. Is it Matt Bourne or Matt Osborne? I believe it was Matt Bourne uh, who was who brought the Doink the Clown character to life. But uh, Skinner, Steve Kern, did it for a little while as well. So he was out of the business for a while after that ran its course. He was brought back by John Laurinaitis, who we hear from a lot, um, and we hear a lot from him in this documentary. He was brought back as an agent in 2004. We see a lot of pictures of him working with the SmackDown talent at that point. Um, but he told John Laurinaitis, this just ain't working out for me. I'm getting older. I can't really run the ropes. I can't really do anything physically anymore, but I still want to teach. I still want to train. So... This is where FCW comes in. OVW and HWA were previously WWE's go-to developmental territories, but they didn't own either of them. So Lauren Ida said, listen, what we're going to do is we're going to close both of those branches, or at least our affiliation, affiliation with both of them, and we'll just give you your own developmental system that you can run yourself in Florida because that's where he's from. And it was also smart because they could attract more people down there as opposed to, you know, Ohio or any other state out there. I mean, maybe... Up in you know in, in the Northeast where the Connecticut you know headquarters are in Stanford. Other than that, Florida was a very popular spot for wrestlers to be bred and you know trained and whatever. So Florida was a very smart place to do it. Specifically, Tampa. So we hear from Heath Slater, who talks about it. He recalled the conversation that management had with a talent down in uh, down in Deep South about how um, the talent were being told they were moving to Florida. And again, I don't know if Deep South itself closed or WWE just ended their partnership with them. I don't know. But basically what the original deal was, was that WWE didn't own the promotions outright. They simply paid them to train their talent. Kern, though, Steve Kern owned FCW. Yeah, it was a contract kind of made between himself and the WWE for them to be developmental, but everything else was of his own doing. He had complete financial responsibility of FCW. He owned the building, you know, the warehouse, everything. Everything was all Steve Kern's doing, which is why it wasn't this fancy facility because they weren't giving him any money to make this thing happen. It was all, again, his own money that he was making FCW out of here. So we wanted to come up with something completely new um, as opposed to reusing old initials. And they had championship wrestling from Florida. So we merely, again, not all that original, but kind of reworded that into Florida Championship Wrestling, therefore coming up with the initials FCW. Um, The talent were kind of told to wait around for a while until the building was ready, and they started off with no building until coming up with a building, I think that was like fucking Hitmasters, some like batting cage place. Like it was still a legit batting cage. They, They had batting cages there, and they would set up a ring right next to it. And the Hitmasters place wasn't really happy with it because they served as a distraction, the wrestlers did, while they were training, and people wouldn't really go there to, um, you know, do the, the batting cages and whatnot, they would watch the wrestlers. So it kind of became a distraction, took away from their business. And it was only ever supposed to be a temporary move, but it really, really became temporary when the, when the place that hosted them was like, okay, this isn't really working out. You got to find the new building. 
And they only started out with about 20 people on the roster, including the Bellas and Italia Heath Slater, people like that. So they found a warehouse to move into. They had, like, canned goods in the background. They were sitting on, like, cans of peas and shit like that. Like, it was a really... Like, when they say a grimy building, that's exactly what they're talking about. Not exactly the glitz and glamour of working for WWE. Not exactly what people would expect. And again, Kern was completely financially responsible for all of this. So it was his responsibility also to find trainers for FCW. So he scouted several people, including Billy Kidman, who I think was already working for WWE at that point. He may not have been, but I know he retired or kind of wind down his in-ring career with WWE in like 04, 05. He was big there for a while coming over from WCW. He kind of winded down his in-ring career, became a trainer in FCW, brought in Norman Smiley from FCW, or uh, not FCW, I'm sorry, uh, WCW. And I think that was the first time that he was brought brought in at all. Uh, by WWE as a trainer. I don't know if he had done the agenting thing before that. I don't think so. But he was one of the, you know, uh, first and foremost people that Kern brought in because he knew he trusted him from his WCW days. He knew he was a, he had a great mind for the business, so why not? Joey Mercury was uh, Joey Mercury was another guy. I think they adopted Mercury as a trainer later on. We don't hear from Mercury here. I can see why. It kind of, I don't know. I don't want to um, you know, speculate, but, you know, he had that weird behavior there for a while, um, late last year with the whole Ring of Honor thing, he was working with the Ring of Honor, and kind of went off the deep end a little bit with some of the stuff he said online, not to say that what he said wasn't true, um, but his behavior and some of the stuff he was saying, he was printing, like, text messages and shit, like a very, I don't know, it was very bizarre, to say the least, so I'm not very shocked, I'm not shocked at all, actually, that we did not hear from Mercury in this documentary, though it would have been cool, because he played a very big part in the development of talent in FCW later on, in the latter years anyway, of the promotion. Um, but I think he joined like in 2010, because I know he came back to the company in 2010 for that very short stint with CM Punk as part of the Straight Edge Society. Then I think he went back to FCW after that. But above all else, they brought in Dusty Rhodes specifically for the promos, because they knew he was a character, very successful. He influenced uh, uh, Steve Kern and many other people back in championship wrestling in Florida. And he was among the best communicators in all of wrestling. So why wouldn't you if you had the opportunity to bring in Dusty Rhodes to train your talent? Uh, we hear from Gerald Briscoe a lot on this documentary. who said that FCW was the uh, that Dusty Rhodes rather was the face of FCW. Uh, Corey Graves was another guy that we hear a lot from on this documentary. Um, he rewatches his tryout match and he's so embarrassed because of how bad it was and how bad his promo was and all this other stuff. So Tyson Kidd says that 70% of the talent roster wrestled prior to signing with FCW. People like Rollins, himself, Natalia, 30% of the talent, 30% of the talent were relatively new to wrestling, uh, which I feel like is kind of the same ratio today. Everyone they bring in NXT does not have prior wrestling experience. Not, I mean, not when I say that, I mean, not, not everybody they bring in used to be Ring of Honor World Champion or wrestled here or there. Like, some people they bring in, you know, res- you know, played football or were bodybuilders or were models, and that was the case with someone like Alex Riley, who I don't think wrestled prior to WWE. The Bella Twins definitely did not. They were basically models. They were athletes, but they weren't, you know, uh, indie wrestlers at, by any means at all. WWE was, like, their first shot at doing it. And to their credit, they got a lot better, but I'll talk about the Bellas later. Um, bum, bum, bum. Rollins, for example, was a former Ring of Honor world champion. He was actually the world champion for Ring of Honor back in 2010, 2009. I forgot exactly when. He was the champion, though, when he signed his FCW contract. But he quickly realized that there were a lot of people that were hired on potential alone, and they saw potential in him. Um, but talent went to FCW to get better. Not just people they brought in from the indie scene and, you know, models and athletes and stuff like that, but people from the main roster, which is kind of the case, that was kind of the case with, uh, OVW as well, but Big Show, and they talked about it in his, um, Stone Cold Sessions episode with Stone Cold a couple weeks ago. He went back down to OVW to get better after his first year in the company wasn't exactly what they hoped it would be. FCW was no different. Kurt Hawkins went down there after his run wrapped up with the Edgeheads. He was at the top of the world, WrestleMania tag team champion on every SmackDown, and then it was over. Um, Ryder went to ECW. Hawkins, they had no plans for, so he simply went back to FCW to save his career. Why not go somewhere to get better? I feel like Tyson Kidd kind of did that same thing um, with NXT. You know, years later when the main roster had no plans for him, 
So he went back to NXT to get better, and it saved his career. And, and, and Hawkins was no, uh, was no different. Drew McIntyre. So he went from OVW to the main roster literally within three weeks. Probably the quickest turnaround ever in the history of WWE developmental, where he was only there for three weeks before he debuted on SmackDown in 2007. But he had no idea what to do. He had no idea what he was doing. He didn't know about anything. So McIntyre was brought in, had a maybe match or two on the main roster, and he already talked about this on that Break It Down show a few weeks ago, so I was already kind of aware of this. Didn't even know where the hard camera was. So he was bumped right back down to FCW relatively quickly after the main roster run didn't exactly pan out the way that they hoped. Um, But all the talent that we hear from praised Tom Pritchard. He was a big part of FCW, Dr. Tom Pritchard. Rollins calls him, uh, says that he kept it all together. He's an unsung hero. Um, Billy Kidman actually wrestled on some of the shows for FCW because he had a name. A lot of these people didn't have a name, so why would anyone want to pay money to see all these unknowns? I mean, yeah, it was WWE's developmental program, but I don't really know that they branded it as, oh, the future of WWE, like, these are people you'll be seeing on Raw or SmackDown soon. It's not like today with NXT, like, oh, shit, we know X, Y, and Z, Kevin Owens, Rollins, Balor, blah, 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 all came from NXT. NXT must be cool. Like, it must be the, the breeding ground for the future. FCW was brand new, so they didn't really have that yet, so they had Billy Kidman wrestle on some of the shows, which is kind of funny. Uh, Joey Mercury was largely responsible for recruiting a lot of the talent. Um, I could see, I mean, Rollins really praises him. I could see Mercury being the one to bring Rollins in, because I think Mercury may have worked with him when he was with Ring of Honor um, before his most recent stint there. Norman Smiley actually gave Kurt Hawkins his power slam. The power slam that Hawkins does where he like raises people, it's hard to describe, it's hard to describe, but Smiley used to do that in WCW and he taught it to Hawkins and Hawkins did it so well. And I know the move because I've seen Hawkins do it before in a lot of his matches. He did it so well, Smiley just said, hey, just do it now. It's yours. I'm, I'm giving you the move, which is really cool. <laughs> All the talent talk about how it was so hot inside. I mean, yeah, it's Florida, but they were in a fucking warehouse and they had the ability to turn the air on. But a big part of it was that Steve Kern didn't want to pay the money. And I guess maybe not having the heat on help with their, or not having the air on really help with their conditioning. I don't know. But I think a big reason was that's largely bullshit. I think a big reason was he didn't want to pay the money. If, if it was helping with their conditioning, then the performance center would never have air conditioning on. But I doubt that's the case. It's, pro- it's probably because Steve Kern, again, backed this entire thing financially. And he just didn't want to pay the money, which I understand even though everyone hated it. Um, they, uh, speaking of things everyone hated, they played a game called Man in the Middle, where they would have talent in each corner of the ring and then someone in the middle. And they would just take bumps and people would get winded and, and, and blown up really, really quickly. But it taught them repetition, so it worked. They would do like hour-long matches with Pritchard, who broke his ankle in a, in a mini-match, when I say mini, like a, a tryout exhibition match, whatever, with Heath Slater, and he still wrestled. And he came in with a boot the next day, and he ended up giving Slater the boot, which he still has today in his home, which is kind of funny. But yeah, they would never wrestle. Like Natalia was doing hour-long matches with, um, with Pritchard. And she's like, I'll never have a 56-minute match on Raw. Why are we doing this? But it also taught her, listen, if I could do this in FCW, a 56-minute match with Tom Pritchard, then I can do anything. You know what I mean? So it kind of worked out well. They also talk about the name process, too, how they got their names. Bailey talks about how, like, you, you hear this a lot in podcasts. Jericho talks about it a lot on his podcast and on Talk is Jericho and interviews that he does with the WWE people about how she didn't love her name initially when she got it, but... Um, she went with it because she wanted to be like Davia, because her name on the independent scene, I think was Davina Rose. She wanted to be Davia, but they weren't exactly buying it. They wanted to call her Bailey. Didn't love it, but she was getting called up to FCW TV or maybe NXT TV that week. I don't know. That week. So she went with it. Her small change, though, was that they wanted to call her Bailey by the traditional spelling, B-A-I-L-E-Y, I think it was. Um, but she wanted it to be Bay, B-A-Y-L-E-Y because she kind of felt the connection there being from the Bay Area in California. So that's where the Bailey came from, the Bay and Bailey came from, which I don't think I ever knew that. I may have read that somewhere before, but that doesn't ring any bells. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, but again, what the process was, for those unaware, was that the talent was usually asked to come up with the list of names. And more often than not, and more often than not nine times out of ten, they would almost always get declined. Big E, this is the dumbest thing, and I may have heard this elsewhere. Again, this may be out there already. I don't know if this is breaking news from this documentary. Big E, and I'll talk about how we got Big E in a second. 
But the name that he wanted was Melman. Yeah, Mel Men, uh, Mel Man. So it was M E L, like Mel, like Mel Gibson. And the second name, the last name was going to be Man, M A N N. Because he wanted to be a wrestling mailman. How fucking dumb is that? That is so stupid. That was his own idea, too. That wasn't a WWE idea. That sounds like Dude the dum- Dumpster Drosy or whatever the fuck. Or like, you know, Isaac Yankum DDS. Isaac Yankum? Come on. The, the Big E came up with this character himself. That's so dumb. Um, but he ended up becoming Big E. Because I think his, I forgot what his actual name is. Like, it's something that you can't really pronounce easily which I probably won't be able to pronounce it easily, uh, pronounce it accurately here on the show anyway. So he, his name began with an E. People can never really say his name, so he was always E. People always called him E, and he was always a big kid. So people always called him, he always was Big E. So it was a natural name for him to adopt, and they ended up giving him the Langston name a while later. Um, they had like they kind of paired it off with something else, and thankfully when they got to the main roster, they dropped that part of it, and Big E, just sound, it just sounds natural now, um, even without the last name there. Even though they already have a big show and a big cast, or they did have a big cast, whatever. It doesn't really matter now that Big Show's kind of no longer active regularly, and Big Cast is gone, so it doesn't really matter. But there was a time there, like in early 2016, they had a big cast, a big show, and a big E. Uh, very repetitive. Anyway, um, so Corbin had all these awesome names, like 38 names. They declined every single one of them. Um, they came up with a few names like... Conovan Corbin or some dumb name like that and he was like oh that doesn't sound all that good so I guess I'll go with Baron Corbin and there you go there's my name you know um so stupid Dusty loved Seth for some reason he loved saying Seth so that's how Seth Rollins got his name and the Rollins came from Henry Rollins so that's how we got the the second half of his name um Sheamus always liked Sheamus O'Shaughnessy that's what he was known as I I don't know if he was known as that in the independent scene but he was definitely known as that in FCW um, cause it was very like warrior, like he loves being intense. So it just kind of worked. And then they dropped the O'Shaughnessy when he got called up to FCW. Big, he had a really tough time when he first showed up there cause he had the athletics part down. He was very, very athletic, but he had to learn how to be entertaining. And indie stars never really had to speak until they got the promo class in FCW. That was when they were really in for a rude awakening. They called it, it's promo class. Dusty called it communication skills because it sounds fancier. It's a more like, it's a nicer way of, of saying like, hey, you got to improve your promos because they suck, you know? And everyone said promo class was either really, really fun or it was really, really stressful. And Dusty Rhodes would assess every single promo. He would not let any of that shit pass by. A lot of people would repeat themselves or he would remember a promo that you did from six months ago. If you repeated yourself, he would let you have it. He would remember. He was on his game when it came to that type of stuff. But he he became a mentor. He was very harsh to the talent early on. But once he kind of dropped the Dusty Rhodes persona type thing, he became a mentor and a friend to a lot of these people. And they showed that Hard Times promo from years and years ago to all the students because of how fucking good it was. They used that as an example as a, uh, you know, as a... uh, kind of a, what's the word I'm looking for here? Not a, as an example, but like as a, um, what, what people should be doing. You know what I mean? I, I don't know what the exact word for that is off the top of my head. But they use that as a, as a format, I guess, for other people, for aspiring superstars in WWE. Um, but he would always explain, he wouldn't just poop on promos for the sake of pooping on them. He would say how they're bad. He would, you know, say they suck, but they, he would explain why they sucked, you know, and, and give them tips as to how to improve. Um, Bailey like broke down crying one time in one of her promos talking about why she wanted to wrestle so bad and Dusty loved it. Dusty saw potential in a lot of different people. That's where all these people kind of got their start was from Dusty Rhodes. Um, they said the character class was very entertaining, at least when they weren't doing it because that's where people kind of came up with characters for themselves and it, and it worked, uh, more often than not. Rollins praised Leo Kruger who didn't pan out. He became Adam Rose, and it flopped in the main roster, and he was gone by 2016. Um, but Leo Kruger was very creative with the Leo Kruger thing, the Adam Rose character. He, he praises uh, Shaw Guerrero, um, the daughter of Vicky Guerrero. That never, I think she had a couple different stints in NXT and in developmental, and it never really worked out, unfortunately. Um, Xavier Woods was another one that he praises as just being a genius. Um, other people they bring up, Sasha brings up Aiden English. I think Kern brings up Byron Saxton, or maybe Pritchard did. Uh, he was a great promo. Um, Heath Slater was always very entertaining. Alex Riley, Kurt Hawkins says, would always knock it out of the park. Another guy that never really panned out. On the main roster, he had a shot, and for whatever reason, it didn't work out. 
The standouts, though, were uh, Big Poppy Sanchez. Never heard of that guy. Uh, Molosaurus, or he had a mullet, so maybe it was Molosaurus, but he had a weird look to him. He was Australian. Never heard of the guy, but the guy was a great promo, apparently. I don't know what happened to him. Nick Rogers, again, great talker, but he would always cut the same fucking promo. And Dusty, no matter what he told the guy, the guy would always come back with a different character, same promo, and it always pissed them off. Bray Wyatt, though, stood out to everybody. Maybe in the latter years of FCW, after he kind of had his run on the main roster, but when he got down there and, and gave birth to that Bray Wyatt character, people were like, holy shit, like, this is someone to pay attention to. Like, they could see the star power from a mile away in Bray Wyatt. Um, the perception of the Bellas when they first showed up there was that they didn't pay their dues. So Natty, I mean, which wasn't true, not that they didn't pay their dues, but like they were, there were rumors that they were rich and all this other stuff, which was obviously far from the truth. Natty helped them train in exchange for fashion tips because she wasn't all that great with style at that point. So they, they became really good friends through that. And they also kind of got heat one time and being brought up to TV for a WWE show or whatever. And they didn't know about the the way that things were done backstage at WWE shows. They didn't know about the culture at the WWE shows. They didn't know about shaking hands. So they were kind of, they had some heat there for a little bit when they first showed up to FCW because they weren't, you know, immersed in the culture quite yet. They weren't told about that type of stuff, and that's not really their fault. Um, But that's where we transition into the women's part of this documentary, which is really cool to hear about, that the women, for a long stretch of time, this was obviously at the peak of the Divas division in WWE. And when I say peak, I'm talking like bikini contests, two-minute, eight-woman tag team matches, which were a fucking joke. They were still having bikini contests there for a while in FCW in short matches, but Paige stood out. Paige was a standout in that division. Um, she was really, really good when they brought her, and I think in 2011, if I'm not mistaken, the Bellas worked very hard. Naomi was actually the first ever Divas champion in FCW, the first woman ever, I think, the, maybe the only woman, but definitely, I think nah, Paige was probably an FCW women's champion, too. But I think Naomi was the first woman to hold the Divas Championship in FCW, the SmackDown Women's Championship, and the Diva... Uh, was she a former Divas Champion? I don't think so. I don't think she was. Um, when we had the Divas title on the main roster, I don't think she was. I think the SmackDown Women's title was her first ever like championship. Um, but she may have been the first woman to hold gold in those two places. Uh, I'm not exactly sure. I would have to look that up. But she made history is the point, and she was really, really good there. Um, and she's always been good. She actually helped. She's credited for building the division down in FCW, that women's division, with Serena Deeb. Even well after Serena got called up to the main roster, she was still making appearances down in FCW because she didn't wrestle on SmackDown. She may have had one or two matches ever, like against Kelly Kelly or some shit. But other than that, she never really wrestled on SmackDown. So she would you know, uh, appear simultaneously down in FCW working with Naomi, and they had a lot of great chemistry and matches together. There was a lot of multi-generational talent at the time. Down in FCW, people like Ted DiBiase Jr., I think Brett DiBiase was there for a while. He's not really mentioned, but Curtis Axel, Roman Reigns, Natalia, Charlotte, Wes Briscoe was another guy. I completely forgot was in WWA. Completely forgot about that. Um, He was impressive, but he got hurt, and that was kind of it for him. He went to TNA years later, And maybe it was the injury that kind of, he wasn't the same after the injury, but I saw nothing in that guy when he was in Impact for a year or two, a part of the Aces and Eights bullshit a couple years ago. It's more than a couple years ago at this point. Now it's like seven or eight years ago. I don't know. Maybe it's just me, but I never really saw what people saw in him. I just thought he was a good hand, but he was never really anything special. Very happy they brought up Richie Steamboat, though. Very happy they talked about him. He had all the tools. He He could go in the ring. He could talk. But he always struggled living in the shadow of his father, uh, Ricky Steamboat. He got hurt, and he never made it back. I think he had a very serious back injury. I feel like I asked Ricky Steamboat about that when I met him a couple of years ago, and he said that he was doing well, or he retired, I don't know. But um, yeah, he got hurt, and he never made it back. And uh, Briscoe thinks, uh, Gerald Briscoe, that is, he says that he never really, he, he thinks that he never really had the passion for it in the first place, which is why it didn't work out. So back to Steve Kern, he talks about how he wanted to run as many live events as possible because you can learn anything, you know, wrestling in front of nobody. I mean, you can learn only so much wrestling in these warehouses with nobody there. So they needed to learn about wrestling in front of an audience. So they did shows at a bar and it was in front of those people that they learned. You learn wrestling in front of these people, regardless of where it is and who it is, regardless of whether they're wrestling fans or not, this is how you learn. They didn't have dressing rooms. It was nothing fancy. They would sometimes get changed, and Natalia said, in, in the same bathrooms that the fans were in. 
that's how, you know, uh, dingy the, these places that they would go to were. They wrestled in, like, small, unknown cities and towns in Florida. They wrestled in parking lots, flea markets, you name it. That's where they wrestled, except for, like, big, luxurious buildings. That's where they went to. It was basically like an indie company, but it was WWE. They were doing all the school stuff. The Florida local market knew about them, but no one outside of Florida knew FCW even existed. And I was a big wrestling fan at that point. I started to get into it in late 2000s. I knew nothing about FCW. I think I knew it existed, knew nothing else about it beyond that. Um, the talent had to do all the promotion themselves as part of a street team. So they would have people go out and put up flyers on telephone poles illegally. You couldn't do it. They tried not to get caught. So a part of their job was to do something illegal, essentially. And they had a lot of issues with that type of stuff. So, like, people would show up and be like, oh, you can't do this. And Steve Kern would, would say, oh, I didn't know that. I'm so sorry. We'll never have it. We'll never let it happen again. And they would go right around. They would turn around and do it again. I guess Steve Kern had a right-hand man named Alfred, who I guess was a lawyer or whatever. I don't know. But he made all the posters himself. The talent fucking hated this guy. He would go to wherever and find the posters in the trash. He'd be pissed. He'd be like, listen, go back and bro- put the programs back up. I did not put all this effort, all this effort into these, into these posters for nothing. Although the programs look terrible. Speaking of the programs, there were stories about the talent and the programs they would pass out of the shows. Like Rollins had to do a photo shoot, um, like in front of a folk- fucking motorcycle. I think EC3, Derek Bateman had to do a photo shoot at like a beach. It looked really, really stupid. Um, but I mean, they did all the photo shoots in front of a green screen at Alfred's office and Big E understood what was going on. He kind of got it because, you know, you got to pay your dues, but it was really dumb in retrospect for a lot of these people. Um, the decision was made by John Laurinaitis himself to make FCW locally broadcast and not, you know, on like NXT what it is today because they only wanted a minimal amount of exposure for their developmental talent. They didn't want other people knowing about what was going on down in FCW at this point. But um, they did learn about making TV because they filmed their own little show for that local audience. And uh, Marty Miller, I guess, is a current TV director for the main roster, but he was a cameraman for WWE years ago. And there was talk about him becoming a director, a TV director um, on the main roster. But he actually requested, can I go down to FCW and do it down there? Because I feel like I could really get my, you know, find my footing as as a cameraman, as a cameraman TV director down there before I can make it to the big time on the main roster. So FCW was the training ground for everybody, and they didn't know how they were going to fill those arenas for TV tapings that they would film every Thursday, so everything was affordable. I think Curran said tickets were like $5, and everything was affordable. All the food, the Coke, the candy, the pizza was all a dollar, because identity was very important to Steve Curran, and making people come to the show was very important to him. He was actually inspired by Gordon Soley, who on those championship wrestling from Florida shows, he would... Uh, Gordon Soley, that is, say, so long from the Sunshine State. And they would tag out every show for FCW saying, you know, uh, good night from the FCW arena. That was very important to Steve Kern. And he was very inspired by championship wrestling from Florida, tried to model FCW after that, and specifically people like Gordon Soley, who had a lot to do with the success of promotions like that. Uh, we hear from Drew McIntyre, who was very proud to be FCW champion and represent the brand. Uh, Pritchard praises him, as does everyone else, talking about how he was always willing to learn. But Sheamus also talks about how, or Corey Graves, that, yeah, they were under the WWE banner, kind of, technically. They were. It was on their paychecks, but they definitely were not getting paid like WWE superstars. I feel like that's an issue today still, like in NXT, where they're on the not even on the network anymore. They're on USA Network. And maybe the bigger names are getting paid decent money. But the smaller guys, I doubt it. Like, I think that's still an issue today. So I'm kind of surprised they brought that up here. But it was definitely an issue back then where they were barely getting paid. And Sheamus didn't even know if they were getting noticed. How are we supposed to know that we're getting noticed if no one is getting called up? Like, that's kind of scary, you know? Laurinaitis' goal was to, to, was to uh, with Kern, they kind of worked together, to develop talent as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And people got called up at random. It's kind of what the case is today. People get called up at random all the time from the next day. Garza got called up out of nowhere after Rumble weekend. It's not like, oh, the same time every year, like right after WrestleMania. Yes, sometimes. But most of, the, most of the time, people get called up just when they need a spot to be filled. So there really was no rhyme or reason behind it whatsoever. Cesaro was like one of the quickest people to get moved up. He got moved on FCW, got signed in late 2011, got moved to the main roster by like April of 2012. Um, and at one point, eight to 10 of those FCW guys got told they were getting called up at one time. 
and it ended up being the Nexus crew for NXT. Um, Sheamus was told he was going to ECW in the summer of 2009, really took off from there. Serena was asked whether she would shave her head for that SmackDown angle with CM Punk. That kind of led to a nice little run for her on the main roster, and it didn't work out, unfortunately, but she was there for a while. Um, Freddie Prinze Jr. actually joined the WWE SmackDown writing team in 2008, and he was like, oh my God, you guys have twins down in FCW? We want them on SmackDown. So he was actually responsible for them being brought up to SmackDown in the summer of 2008. The NXT guys, back to them, um, they didn't think it would be a game show when they heard that it was, and they'd have to do like keg challenges, keg carrying challenges, and doing this and that, all this other bullshit. They were like, what the fuck is this? You know, like, this is so dumb. Um, Seth Rollins was super antsy to get called up. All these people got called up before him. He got signed again either in late 09, early 2010, I forget exactly when, but he was there for a while. Um, I, I, w- I want to say in late 09 after Brian and Nigel, if not early 2010. But anyway, um, you know, he saw all these other people that he thought weren't as good as him getting called up. But he was only really an FCW to be fine-tuned because when they hired him, they kind of knew that he'd be a top star. They saw him as a star in Ring of Honor. He was one of those guys that um, they knew that he was already ready for the big show. He was only an FCW to kind of get fine-tuned for the big show. They never really explained why he didn't get called up sooner, but I assume it was because they just had no place for him and they felt he was too big for the NXT show, the game show bullshit. A lot like Roman and and Ambrose were never a part of that show. Despite being under contract, um, they just weren't used for it because they had bigger plans for them. So they waited and waited and waited, and then the Shield came to be, and that was it. But before that, though, he was in developmental for a while, and he actually got in hot water for being so vocal about not being happy in FCW because he thought he was ready. He actually had conversations with Triple H about his future because he was very uncertain he would ever be called up. And he was very close. He said he was one X marks away, one X mark away from being fired back in 2011, 20, uh, 2010, 2011, 2012. So anyway, to kind of transition into NXT, Triple H was taking over developmental. Um, all the talent heard rumblings that something was going to happen. And just you know, like that, FCW became NXT very, very quickly. Um, Triple H took over as the executive vice president, I, whatever his exact title is, of uh, talent relations in 2011. I think I remember reading the rumor that NXT was surpassing, was kind of, you know, uh, swallowing FCW, kind of merging the two into one, that NXT would be the new go-to developmental program by like early 2012. I remember reading that. They didn't close the warehouse officially until 2013, but the process really began to close down FCW as early as like March of 2012. So it's been like eight years since FCW was really around, although they continue to run shows through like the summer of 2012 until um, NXT TV became to be, and, you know, it became what it is today in the summer of 2012. Anyway, so all the talent were were told to relocate from Tampa to Florida, all the talent, all the trainers, um, and again, the FCW warehouse officially closed in 2013. Steve Kern and, uh, you know, Tom Pritchard, they understood it. They had no ill feelings towards um, Triple H for doing what he did, kind of closing down FCW, not even kind of, he did. Um, they had no ill feelings. I don't know what Pritchard did. You know, Steve Kern just didn't want to relocate. So he did, he just said, no, his contract was coming due at the end of the year. And everyone was moving to Orlando. Everyone did. Norman Smiley, all these other people. He didn't want to move, so that was it. But I think they didn't want to re-sign him anyway, uh, which is kind of shitty. But anyway, I, I think it was a mutual decision for him to part ways with the company when FCW uh, was kind of engulfed by NXT in 2012. So all the new students were relatively fine with it. The older students, not so much. They weren't as thrilled because they didn't want to relocate. They had been there for a while. They had families. They had. They were kind of stationed in Tampa. They didn't want to relocate. So it was kind of a, a divisive decision made at that point. Um, but at any rate, Triple H realized that there needed to be a change on every level in terms of not just the talent, but like the camera work and, and everything, the promos. They needed to be taught the future of the business. And the Performance Center had exactly that. It had all the tools. It has all the tools. It's been around since 2013. Um, It's easy to realize that when you walk in that building, this is going to get you to that next level. When you walk into that FCW warehouse, not so much. It's easy to think, or it's not easy to think, you know, I'm signed by WWE. I'm going to make it to Raw or SmackDown one, you know, one day. I'm, I'll be ready through all the facilities they have here. The FCW had none of that. But when you walk into the PC, I've never been there myself. But when you walk in there, it feels like the big, the, the big time. And Bailey was someone that was content in FCW. And she walked in the Performance Center. And she was like, holy shit. Like, you guys still want me to train here? Like, 
this is amazing. Um, so anyway, Big, Big E says that he still has a soft spot for FCW. And then actually in the Performance Center is amazing. Don't get me wrong. Don't get him wrong. But he still has a very soft spot for FCW because it made him the talent that he is today. Um, the warehouse actually became a bounce house. And they have this great video at the end of this documentary of former talent going to visit. People like Steve Kern is there, which is cool. Um, they go in and, and kind of see what the building has become all these years later. And they kind of reminisce and, and share stories. So Heath Slater is there, um, Byron Saxton, Tyson Kidd, Titus O'Neil, Natalia, maybe one or two other people. Big E, I think, is there. Um, just a very cool reunion with all the former FCW people. And Steve Kern talked about it, and Heath Slater thanks Steve Kern for all that he did for FCW and all that, all that he did for him and everything. And uh, Kern talked about how he only brought in people to kind of mentor and be trainers in FCW that he knew were passionate about the business. People like Norman Smiley, Mercury, Dusty Rhodes, et cetera, et cetera. And um, he had an influence on all of them, on all those people in their careers. Heath Slater talks about how he's had a lot of good memories down in that building at the FCW warehouse. And Tampa is Kern's home, and he takes a lot of pride in their success. They also talk about how WrestleMania 36 is going to be in Tampa this year, which is very true, uh, hopefully, as long as it doesn't get canceled. Because um, <laughs> I know I know Tampa's, Tampa Bay City had like a case of the coronavirus like a week ago. So I don't think it'll be canceled, but it could very well be relocated. I'm not banking on it. I don't think it's going to happen. But hey, you, you never know. It may not be Vince's call. Vince would never cancel it. But it may not be his call. It may be the city saying, hey, you got to cancel because it's, it's just too much of a risk with 80,000 to 100,000 people in the same city for one event from all over the world. That, that's a risk right there, especially if there's a, uh, an existing case of the coronavirus in the city. But anyway, um, Pritchard talked about how he's proud of his FCW students and all that they've accomplished. Heath Slater says that FCW put a smile on my face and to close it out, we hear from Seth Rollins and the legacy that FCW leaves behind. And that NXT does not exist without the sacrifices that we made in FCW. And then they closed it out with an, a, a promo from Rollins from FCW when he was the FCW champion, I think, when he said that uh, we are the future of WWE here in FCW and the future is now, which is absolutely accurate. NXT, a lot of their guys currently occupy the main roster, which is kind of crazy when you think about it now. But anyone who's not from NXT probably came from FCW. And... I mean, there, there's still people like, I mean, AJ didn't go through any of that stuff. He came from TNA. But there's people like The Undertaker still around and Big Show and Kane and Matt Hardy and he's not around in WWE now. But, you know, didn't go through any of those systems. But 90% of the roster, I want to say, between Raw and SmackDown, if they didn't come from NXT, they came from FCW. So like I said, I was really happy they made this documentary. I thought it was very well put together. It was amazing stuff. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I, I I was very happy they devoted as much time to it as they did. It's an hour and 18 minutes. Like, that's longer than most of the interviews I see on this network or the 24s or anything else. Um, even the original specials like this one are not this long. So I thought that was really, really cool. And they covered pretty much everything for a five-year span. They got a lot of shit in there. And it could have very easily been a 20-minute special or like even a 30, 45-minute special. But they went all in on this thing and it paid off. I thought it was really, really good. So check it out right now. The future of WWE, the future WWE rather, the FCW story, the story of FCW right now on the WWE Network. Um, it's well worth the time. I think it's probably airing tonight if you're listening to this before Elimination Chamber. You probably won't because I don't, I don't think this video will be up until the pay-per-view starts. Um, but anyway, though, uh, this was amazing stuff. And um, if it airs tonight after the pay-per-view, which it probably should, be sure to check it out. Um, on the WWE Network. As far as my review, thank you guys for checking it out. I appreciate it. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment, share the video, and subscribe to the channel for more daily content. Tomorrow, my latest review of the WWE Ruthless Aggression Show. Um, I think it's focusing on the brand split and the draft and everything else, which I'm very excited to hear about. So um, that should be up tomorrow, if not a little later on in the day, depending on when I watch it. Other than that, guys, again, this is probably going up right around the time that Elimination Chamber is starting. I will not be watching the show live, I don't think. Maybe on a slight delay. Can't say I really care too much about the pay-per-view. Fuck Elimination Chamber, so watch this instead, I would say. <laughs> but anyway, enjoy the event if you're watching. Enjoy the rest of your weekend for what we have of it left. It's actually very bright outside as I record this at 5 p.m. because we had... I completely forgot that we had daylight savings today. Uh, thank God it was today and not yesterday. I had to wake up at 6 yesterday to go to the big event in New York City. But I talked all about that in my SmackDown review. If you haven't already checked that out, 
um, late last night here on the channel. But nonetheless, guys, have an awesome one. I'm Graham G.S. Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.